You can see the seed which is shiny and bold. This is what uh, is the uh, farmer's preference and the market preference. So farmers uh, in uh, Midwest are growing soybean and corn and uh, they have not, uh, they are not using this crop because they were not seeing the market. But now with the plant-based protein industry booming, again, you know, farmers are looking for more options to grow crop. So hi, I'm Aarti Singh and I'm a mung bean breeder. So I'm plant breeder by training and here at Iowa State, I'm doing mung bean breeding. So the reason we picked mung bean is, mung bean is a warm season legume crop and it's similar to soybean, which is also a warm season legume crop. And since the, the plant architecture is similar to soybean, we thought to pick this crop will help us in future because farmers don't have to change their machinery and planting or com combining. In my breeding program, we chose mung bean because they are easy to grow. It's a very short duration crop. It matures in six, 60 to um, 90 days. That's the beauty of this uh, small uh, duration crop, which matures very fast. Oh yeah, I. Uh originally come from Kenya and in Africa and Southeast Asia, mung beans is a stable. And so I do eat them, um, cook them, you know, boil them and eat them with, with the, so it's a delicacy where I come from. So I have had the chance to grow up eating it um, and also just uh, some of the different products on the market profile right now. Hi, my name is Ashlyn Reardon and I am working in plant breeding with mung beans and Dr. Artie Singh. We make crosses because we need to create lines that we can release for farmers to grow in their fields. We cross by, we take higher performing lines from our yield trials and further down our breeding program and we take those lines, we choose them as parents, either as the male or female and that's chosen by a couple different things. And so we take those and we cross them to hopefully create an offspring that has the best traits of those two parents and is also a high performing line. We decide parents by looking at lines that are currently in our yield trials or our other multi-state trials or whatever ever traits we may be screening for and want to introduce into our breeding population. Uh, successful crosses, we take those and we'll advance them through our program just as their parents did and we'll work them up through multiple trials and they'll have to go through multiple rounds of selection until we decide that this is a good line and we want to release this for farmers to grow in their fields. Hi, my name is Ben Marlow. I work here at Iowa State University on Dr. R.D. Singh's mung bean breeding program. Today we are in the crossing greenhouse and I'm going to walk you through some of the steps of crossing and the mung bean breeding that we do here. So we start crossing between 8 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 8.30, and we cross until about 11 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 11.30. That's because mung beans are a legume and they end up shedding pollen throughout a certain time of the day, not all day. Okay, so this is a already pollinated male flower. Mung beans have both male and female portions, but we're only using the male portion from this one specifically. This is going to be the male portion of the cross we started earlier. So you'll end up opening up the petals and you can see that shiny white stigma right there. So we're gonna remove this. There we go, so we have the stigma and the anthers. This right here is the stigma. So this is what's going to actually accept pollen and become the bean. So these are the anthers right here. These anthers are the male portion that will shed pollen to end up creating the other half of that cross. We can come back to this one that we were at earlier. So this one we've already removed the anthers, so the male portion. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to gently transfer pollen from the anthers to the bottom side of that stigma. So we'll just try and get it up underneath there just a little bit. And then we will close it up to help protect it. And then we'll tag it. We tag it to keep track of what male and what female we're using. Because for some of our crosses, we'll specifically use multiple males for multiple females or vice versa. So we want to keep track to know that this cross was this female in this pot, but also we used a specific male that we needed for that hybridization. In mung beans, we have uh, several different flower colors. We have 
Uh, we can have a pale yellow, we can have olive, and sometimes that's even like a light yellow olive. Uh, we have yellow and bright yellow. Bright yellow is my favorite. Um, and there's also like a red, which is like kind of, it's a deep red or purple color that you can see in the flowers. So this flower here is more of kind of our olive, maybe an olive light yellow. Part of my research is I'm doing a genome-wide association study. So we have about 500 lines that we're growing out in a field and I record flower color on each of them. And I'm going to take that data and associate it with the genome and try to find genes associated with that flower color. Uh, mung beans are kind of like soybean. They can pollinate before they even open. So all of these nodes here were actually spots where flowers grew, but they probably fell off. We do have some pod drop and that's natural for mung beans as well. Um, this is a bud right here, so this is a new one that hasn't come out yet, and this is the top where new buds will continue to grow, new buds will come out. And pods, after they're pollinated, pods grow out of uh, the mung beans very quickly. So this one right here is probably actually like four, maybe five days old. So you can see if you try to make a mung bean cross, which we do in the greenhouse, you'll be able to see your success within like two to five days if your cross took or not. All right, so uh, hey, my name is Kevin Chiteri, a PhD student with uh, Dr. Arti Singh. And some of the traits that uh, I'm looking at is uh, a plant height and uh, growth habit. And one of the things that the breeding program is uh, trying to achieve is to try and integrate uh, the mung beans into the farmer's already existing uh, equipment infrastructure. So we don't want to change it. And uh, because they want to you know, rotate this with soybeans, for example, uh, the plant height of uh, the combining is of importance to us and so I am researching to see what are some of the different heights that mung beans have and which one will be more important uh, you know, to be integrated easily into the, into the equipment. And if you turn around, the other thing that I'm looking at is the growth habit. So you'll have some mung beans that just spread and you know, if you were breeding for uh, a cover crop, this would be really, really good but because we are interested in you know, protein and yield, we want a plant that you know is erect and stands up and makes it easier for combine to go through um, and 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 you know harvest harvest the crop. Um, the other thing that I'm also looking at in my research is just the leaf architecture because of the diversity that we have. We'll be looking at the leaf architecture of, of the mung beans and be uh, you know maybe related to uh, yield, which is the most important thing that you know farmers out here are looking for. So uh, we, we are excited about this crop and I think it's going to be big here in Iowa and you know, in the Midwest and probably people are going to come back and we hope to have some lines out here very soon. So we uh, started our breeding program with 3,000 mung bean lines and from these 3,000 mung bean lines we grew them, we planted each and every uh, single plant uh, from these 3,000 lines uh, and, and field and uh, from these 3,000 lines we selected 500 lines which uh, created our GWAS panel which is genome wide association mapping panels. So our students have some research pro projects where they are phenotyping mung beans for various traits and we have also genotyped this uh, 500 lines using uh, GBS sequencing. So now we have genotyped this crop and same time we are also every year phenotyping uh, mung bean for various nutritional traits, disease traits, stress traits uh, so that we can uh, breed a future cultivar which is uh, high yielding, high in nutrition and uh, better uh, stress uh, resistant or tolerant. It looks like more like lentils to people. Right. So uh, when it comes to mung bean seeds, uh, the seed color can be uh, black, it can be green and yellow. And in my program, we are breeding for green shiny mung beans, which are bold in size. So in, in industry, they, they are using currently green mung beans to produce this egg. Basically the process is they have to split it, dehull it, and then uh, make a flower out of it, and out of which they are isolating protein. But uh, in our program, we are also breeding for yellow mung beans. You can see here the yellow mung beans. And in this, pro in, in this case, I think the processor can um, uh, kill one step. They can get away with the, uh, dehulling it so they can directly use to make flour out of yellow mung beans and then they can uh, directly use it to isolate protein. So our program is uh, breeding for both green and yellow mung beans. And we are also testing the nutrition, uh, nutrition content of these various kind of uh, seeds or, or lines uh, so that uh, we know uh, which lines are better nutrition and we can uh, advance those lines uh, for, to be used in our breeding program. Uh, yeah, mung bean soup is a great thing. I think uh, 
Uh, Ati just mentioned the other day that even mangbin milk is being you know, made in, in Japan. So there's a whole profile of products that we can get from this crop. Uh, and you know, we look, we are, we are really excited uh, as a PhD student working on this crop here in, in the Midwest.